So picking up where we left off uh, from the lecture this morning with obstetrics, uh, standard assessment, standard or scene size up, I mean, and all that kind of stuff. Um, again, remember your um, obstetric patient is not necessarily, pregnancy is not a disease or an illness. This is just an event, something that we are assisting with in the event that there is a um, complication or something like that. The mom can deliver the baby without your help. You're just there. Imagine a, like a football standby waiting to catch the baby when it comes out and intervene if things are um, abnormal. One thing to keep in mind, though, if you're expecting a delivery, have adequate PPE available. Uh, does not need to be sterile gloves, but you definitely want to have a face shield and possibly a gown if you have the time to grab one because delivery can be very messy. Additional resources might be useful or else you'll end up like the Savannah crew um, and not have any help. All right, so assuming that this, that the reason we're there is obstetrics related, your ABCs are probably not going to be a big concern. However, a woman who has experienced some form of trauma or even another medical condition may also be pregnant, in which now you have two things happening kind of a situation. Somebody have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I was looking because I found the link for the, uh, the cadaver lab. Yeah. Uh, so the 150 bucks, are we paying that or is that paid through by central because of that or how does that work? I don't know the um, arrangements that the school has with central. Uh, I know sometimes, uh, a lot of times the students pay it, it's uh, up to the students, but I also know that other times the department pays it for them. So that is a conversation that you'd have to have with your, with whoever uh, talked you into this class, and because I'm not privy to what the agreements between your company and mine is. Sorry. What's our course number again? Uh, we're 2104, class number? 2104 uh, OP2, but you don't, you don't need to look on our class Facebook. You want to just go to the Faithful Guardian Facebook. No, I'm on the website now trying to sign up for it. As oh, you okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2104 OP2. Thank you. All right. So back to airway and breathing course. There you go. Is what it is. So, transport decision. Most of the time, when a woman says she's in labor, everybody's reaction is to transport as fast as possible and, and as quickly, or you know, get on the road as quickly as possible. While that may be the right answer, it's not always the right answer. If the delivery is imminent, if she is already crowning, Okay, I don't mean she says that she's having contractions every one minute or she says that her water broke or anything like that. That's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about crowning. If the baby's crowning, it, delivery is imminent, stay on scene. Do not attempt to load her. Do not attempt to transport because delivering a baby in the back of an ambulance, driving down the road or even stopped on the side of the road like you should so that you can have extra hands in the back, that is not ideal. There is just not enough room in the back of an ambulance to do that comfortably and effectively. So imminent delivery, if at all possible, deliver on scene in their home. <clears throat> then the mess is there for them to clean up and you don't have to worry about it. But the other thing is sometimes women go into labor in public places and or their residence or wherever you're at is just absolutely not conducive to having a baby there and you might need to decide to move to your ambulance i prefer to deliver in the residence simply because the patient is going to be more comfortable there's more room for you to uh, move around with them and work with them and there is going to be um more uh, resources available as far as like towels um water if you need her to take a shower afterwards or clean up or whatever it happens to be 
Um, also, it's a lot easier to get her into a good birthing position on a, on a normal size bed versus on a stretcher. Stretchers are not, uh, ambulance stretchers are not a uh, good option for uh, birthing positions. So, if you don't have uh, imminent delivery, transport the patient laying on her side or in a sitting position as she is comfortable. And then, but uh, yeah. So, when do we transport even um, emergency, even though she is crowning or in active delivery? Anytime you have significant bleeding and pain. Now, significant pain needs to be taken into consideration, or you know, taken with a grain of salt. She's in labor. Um, it hurts a lot from every example I've ever seen of it. So, yeah, it's hurting, but there's something, especially if this isn't her first, there's generally, they're able to know something's different. You know, if, they're, if the pain associated with a uterine rupture or something like, or a baby that's stuck and she's trying, um, and so she's pushing, but the baby's not going anywhere. Those kind of scenarios tend to create a different type of pain and the mom's like, no, something's wrong, something's different. I know, it's, I, I know this isn't right kind of a thing. Anytime you have hypertension or seizures. Women who are pregnant, especially third trimester, have relatively low blood pressures. Having a patient with a blood pressure in the upper 90s is not unheard of and is actually quite healthy. Hypertensive patients is an emergency. Seizures is an emergency. We're already at the eclamptic stage there. Any altered mental status, it doesn't, you know, of any nature. If there's something causing mom to have an altered mental status, there's a really good chance it's going to cause an altered mental status on the fetus. And so you're gonna have complications once delivery happens. So even if there's crowning, even if the patient's in uh, uh, actively delivering, transport emergency when you have these uh, scenarios. All right, of course, OPQRST sample, blah, 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 blah. You want to get all that kind of stuff you can. When was the last uh, gynecologic or OB appointment? When, um, what was the opinion of the doctor or the midwife on the position of the baby, the health of the baby? Were there any concerns? Have they had any complications? What was their last delivery? Was it a uh, vaginal or cesarean? Were they planning on having a vaginal birth this time? Where, what were their intentions or expectations for their birth? Were they intending to deliver at home or at the hospital? Or was their intention to wait till the last second, call 911 and have EMS deliver the baby for them? Um, and try to find out what prenatal care they have. Have they had an ultrasound? Have they been taking prenatal vitamins? Prenatal vitamins and ultrasounds do not prevent the patient from having a complication, or I shouldn't say prenatal, excuse me. Prenatal visits and ultrasounds do not prevent complications. They simply recognize and I, the presence of complications before the baby is delivered. So if a patient says, no, they didn't have ultrasound or no, they haven't had prenatal visits for the last two months or something like that, uh, or longer than that, the last um, six months or so, all, what that means is there could be complications present that you don't know, that nobody knows about. And so anything could happen. If the patient's like, yeah, I had my last prenatal visit yesterday, everything's fine, perfectly healthy, blood pressure was great, baby's heart rate was good, said that I could deliver any day now. Okay, so we know there's nothing that we need to specifically expect about this baby when it's born. You're not going to get surprised with spina bifida or something like that. Gynecologic problems. One of the most important gynecologic problems that you should be aware of is cervical cancer. If the woman has a history of cervical cancer generally associated with genital herpes, it can cause a alteration of the cervix which will complicate the delivery. That generally means the delivery will take longer. So, e so even if it's pushing and seems pretty close, you're probably gonna have more time to transport because they're gonna need a, different, a change of position and such like that to have an effective delivery. So, pretty much covered all this stuff. 
All right, so as far as vaginal discharge, do they have bleeding? Have they saw a noted fluid discharge? Or have they had mucus discharge? The loss of the mucus plug tends to happen within 24 hours or less of the delivery. And so that can be a good indication, though. This is active labor, and we're going to have a baby soon. But again, look for crowning. If you don't have crowning, which is initially indicated or early indications of crowning, is a large bulge in the perineal area in the in the general vulvar area that is the head moving into the vagina. Uh, you, the outer vaginal opening won't, doesn't even necessarily have to be dilated or open, right? It just stretches as the baby. It doesn't dilate like the cervix does. It just stretches as the baby passes through. So if you're noting bulging between her legs, even though you don't see the baby's hair or the head or anything, that's still the baby's in the birth canal, crowning's happening, and we're, we're about to have a baby be prepared for that. Transporting at that time probably wouldn't be the best plan. But uh, passing of the mucus plug tends to happen pretty soon before delivery because that indicates the dilation process of the cervix. As the cervix starts dilating, that mucus plug um, is released and it can be as large as a handful of mucus. It, it can be a significant amount of mucus. It can be a small amount, like that might just show up on their pad or their underwear, but it can be as large as a handful. Three what, Amanda? All right, so another indication that she's about to deliver is when she starts feeling the need to to move her bowels or a need to bear down and push. If you start hearing her grunting and um, holding her breath, look like she's looking like she's bearing down or something, that means she's pushing. She may not even realize she is. It's kind of a subconscious uh, physical response, like automatic response of the body. So be aware of that, look for that. And if she is starting to push, you're not gonna stop her. The contractions are not gonna stop. You're not gonna keep her from pushing the baby out. You're not gonna prevent the delivery from happening any more than you can stop a person from vomiting mid, uh, midstream. Most women who have had a baby already are aware of the feeling and sensation of crowning, and so they're generally pretty helpful at like, no, it, it's crowning, no, we're not there yet kind of a situation. The color of the amniotic fluid that's bringing up here is you're looking for brown staining in the amniotic fluid. You're looking for meconium staining. Meconium staining tends to happen later uh, on later gestation babies, so after 40 weeks. Uh, the longer it's been cooking, the more likely that there is meconium in the amniotic fluid. And the real concern with amniotic, or excuse me, with meconium in the amniotic fluid is the um, possibility that the baby inhaled the uh, Meconium, because remember they breathe in and out amniotic fluid at, uh, while they're still in the amniotic sac, even though they're they're not actually doing anything, they're just physically moving fluid in and out of their body and down their throat and stuff. So they could inhale amniotic uh, meconium, and that would cause an airway obstruction after delivery. And so you're looking for that staining. If there's no staining in the flu amniotic fluid, then there's really no concern for. Um, uh, aspiration of of meconium. All right, getting a patient's vital signs. While useful, necessary, important, good idea, whatever word you want to put there, it is not the highest priority. In fact, if you've got the patient's heart rate, good. Most women, when they're at the verge of labor, when they are pushing and crowning and all that, they do not want you strapping a blood pressure cuff to their arm. It's going to be extremely aggravating. These women are ready to murder the person they love the most at that moment. They do not want some rando stranger trying to squeeze the crap out of their arm with a BP cuff. So if she tolerates it, she's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Go for it. No problem. If she's like, get that crap off me or starts ripping it off while you're while it's trying to take a pressure... Don't worry about it. Don't stress it. Don't scold her. Just move on. It really isn't that big of a deal. So uh, get an idea of your gestational age. You know, how many weeks along is she is what you're looking for. 
Fetal heart tones, great, cool. If you have a Doppler, if you're not, you're not going to hear them. So like, don't don't stress on fetal heart tones. All right, uh, we kind of turned it and talked about this. Um, all right, so let's say we've decided we're going to deliver the baby here at the house. We're we're actually we're going to go through it. She's already crowning. We're already there. Any yeah, anybody seen an old watched an old movie like an old pioneer movie or something like that when the lady's going to go into labor and the midwife shows up? What's the midwife always tell the husband, the daddy, the baby daddy? Boil water and cut up sheets. Yeah, go boil water and cut up sheets. Do you ever see them dunk the baby in the boiling water after it's born? Do you ever see them start tying mom up with sheets? That's how she got pregnant, not how the. It's not what you do at that point. Now, the point of cutting up the sheets and boiling the water was to give dad something to do to make him busy, to make him think that he was being helpful. Because when you have anxious and concerned bystanders, as long as you could give them something that makes them feel involved, that makes them feel like they're being helpful, you have gotten them out of your hair and you've helped calm them down. It's a form of therapeutic communication for them, and it helps you. Now, a lot of times, the uh, birthing mother's uh, partner, significant other, husband, wife, whatever they are, they're going to, not a lot, of, sometimes they're gonna be perfectly willing to help you. They'll be calm, collected enough to uh, participate in the delivery, uh, and they m could be an extremely valuable resource for keeping the mom calm. If, if they themselves are nervous and uh, causing a distraction, go give them something useful to do. Go give them something else to do. You know, you're gonna need towels. You're gonna need lots of towels. She will need clean sheets once the uh, delivery has happened. It's a good idea to put down some trash bags, get some large trash bags, spread them out underneath the towels, lay some towels over top of them, have her sit down on those towels. It'll help clean up the mess later, keep them from staining the mattress too much. Um, but you know, if they're just too spazzy and too upset, go boil water, right? Um, just get them out of your hair. Do something useful with them so um the big thing here is for you to remain calm and reassuring you might be screaming and pulling your hair out on the inside but on the outside just try to stay as calm and reassuring as you can um so and we'll get to specifics about the delivery here in a little bit so serial vial signs whatever fetal heart rate again are you going to be able to do it? I don't know. Probably not. So don't stress it. They make a big deal about that, but don't really overthink that one. Timing contractions. Timing contractions is different than you might uh, think. So let me switch to some. Let me switch to this real quick. All right, so let's say mom's, you're, you know, you're assessing mom and mom has a contraction right here. And let's not use. So mom has a contraction. At that point, the contraction starts. And the contraction you know, builds in its intensity like this, going up, she's still contracting, and then it'll start to taper off. Now, really close to the end, um, sometimes those contractions will start to build up and double peak or something like that and become even more intense, and it never really went away before. Um... But anyway, so the contraction starts to go back down, all right, and so this is at, uh, zero, zero, and then this we'll say is at zero thirty, right? So no, no contraction. Everything's quiet, right? And then 
she starts having another contraction. And this contraction here is at one zero zero. So what we have here are contractions that are one minute apart and lasting 30 seconds. Okay, so if this time here, we'll change this to two minutes. Now we have a 30 minute, a 30 second contraction that let, that are two minutes apart. Or we could change this time and make this a minute 30. And now we have two minute contraction last, or excuse me, a minute and a half contraction, two minutes apart. So the contraction was a total of a minute and a half long, but they're coming every two minutes, right? So frequently we'll get dispatched to a call where they'll say, oh, I'm having contractions and they're two to three minutes apart. And you'll get there and she's like, oh, I haven't had a contraction since I called 911. And then you're loading her in the ambulance and she has a contraction and then she didn't have any more contractions until you get to the hospital. And it's like 15 minutes since the last contraction. You're like, where the crap did the two to three minutes apart come from? Well, the human body is rather in, uh, similar to most other mammals. And if you've ever lived on a farm or lived, been around a farm, you'll probably know that it's nearly impossible to see a cow or a horse or most other mammals birth. Uh, contrary to Hollywood's opinion, it's very hard to see those things happen because the animal wants quiet. They want privacy. They want um, seclusion. They want to know that they're safe. And so you're not going to see that happen. They're not going to go into labor while you're sitting there watching them. And if you, if they start to go into labor and you show up, they're going to stop. They're going to, the labor will uh, stop until you're, they feel safe again. The mom may have been progressing. Now, chances are she was miscounting her contractions, but she may have been progressing pretty rapidly um, and pretty steadily, and she might have been having cl contractions fairly close together. Then we show up, there's a lot of busyness, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of strangers, there's a lot of uncertainty, and her body's like, yep, nope, done, not having a baby right now, which is kind of beneficial to you because then you don't have to deliver the baby in the field, but other times she keeps on keeping on and you end up delivering the baby so there's you know two different options there but that's one of the common reasons your patient will um, call saying they have contractions close together and you arrive on scene and they're nowhere near close together or consistent things you want to look for when you know your con uh, as far as contractions in not just how long they last and how frequent they are but how consistent they are real labor is going to be very consistent contractions and the contractions will get closer together the closer to delivery they will get more intense the closer to delivery and they will um, become more regular the closer to delivery so if you're seeing these contractions trending towards more intensity trending longer trending more frequently these are all indications you're progressing through the stages of labor and you could be delivering a baby pretty soon. All right, so um, if you're delivering pre-hospital, it's probably a good idea to let the hospital know as soon as possible that you are going to be delivering pre-hospital. That way they can have the neonate team ready when you get there. Business hours, probably not a big concern. Um, middle of the night, weekends, they may have to call staff in, so uh, notifying them early would be a good idea. Um, if mom's labor stalls, which is the term for it, if she stops having the contractions or they really decrease in uh, intensity and frequency, go ahead and transport. No reason to delay. Her, her labor stalled. Good time to get to the hospital. All right, so problems that a mother may have or that you may encounter with a delivering mother or the infant right after delivery. Uh, drugs, medications of any type or pretty nearly any type will pass through the placenta barrier into the fetus. So if mom's been snorting cocaine or shooting up heroin or uh, whatever else she prefers, 
that baby's going to get it. And that baby's going to get pretty much the same concentration that mom got. So whatever mom's blood level is, that's what the baby's blood level is going to be. And as you can imagine, mom might be able to tolerate a much higher blood level than that baby can. So this is where your babies may be born um, apneic, uh, possibly even pulseless. Um, but very good chance of altered mental status, lethargy, general weakness, uh, apnea, or respiratory depression, and so you would need to be prepared with uh, Narcan for these kids. But also keep in mind, if mom decided to shoot up heroin or snort some pills right before popping a baby out, it's probably not her first time doing that. She's probably been using it throughout the pregnancy and uh, that baby is very likely addicted. And as such, you push too much Narcan, you could kick that baby into withdrawals. And then you're dealing with seizures and such like that. Because you're dealing with a very small body that is addicted to that opiate or whatever. And so you want to be cautious. What is... What is a good alternative that we have for treatment of respiratory depression as a result of opiate abuse? What do y'all know? What's a good alternative treatment? BVM? Yes, a BVM. A BVM are um, a good way to handle these babies. Just go ahead and drop an ET tube and start ventilating them. A newborn infants are incredibly easy to intubate. Um, there's no teeth. It's a very uh, lightweight uh, jaw and head. Very easy intubations and um, go ahead and maintain um, respirations and such that way. You can control it a lot better and you don't risk the seizures and such like that. All right, so supine hypotensive syndrome, brought that up earlier from the, uh, the quiz and talked about it in the uh, fetal um, development and the changes of the mother's body during pregnancy. A when the uterus is putting pressure on the vena cava, it reduces blood return to the heart. This can cause hypotension. It can also result in fetal distress because if mom's not pumping enough, you know, doesn't have enough cardiac output, then the baby's not going to get enough gas exchange. Uh, also, uh, the human body is selfish and the, mother the mother's body will preserve its own life and its own blood flow at the expense of the fetus. So it will shunt blood away from the uterus in order to per maintain perfusion to the brain, liver, and lungs. So, um, yeah, put them in the recumbent. I think we got this under control. All right, so we talked about how there can be some cardiac changes during the pregnancy process. Um, we talked about the bundle brand, or excuse me, the uh, axis deviation. Um, the mother may also have existing cardiac disease uh, prior to pregnancy. For the most part, the um, peripartum or uh, pregnancy or, or excuse me, cardiac event or cardiac conditions during pregnancy, for the most part, they're going to be treated like any other uh, cardiac condition. Uh, this peripartum cardiomyopathy, this is a woman in labor, um, or excuse me, before she goes into labor, before she delivers. So while she's pregnant, she starts having cardiomyopathy. That is a weakening of the heart muscle. Common uh, Lee, not, it is not a common condition, but it is caused by, typically, the increased cardiac output and the, uh, excuse me, the increased blood volume and the subsequent demand for cardiac output, the heart stresses itself. Hypertension, gestational or chronic, a, a, a woman with hypertension can get pregnant just like any other woman. So like you might be dealing with a previous known condition. So benign or essential hypertension, excuse me. Find out, did you have high blood pressure prior to pregnancy? Did you take medication for it prior to pregnancy? Maybe she had it, but she didn't take medication and pregnancy simply complicated it. 
All right, now, eclampsia and preeclampsia are probably the most common or most concerning hypertensive disorders that we're gonna come up with. These are situations where the woman has developed a toxicology or a, a toxicosis in her blood, and that's starting to have a negative impact on her cardiovascular and neurologic um, systems. So you can see early, uh, really young, or rather old mothers, you know, relatively speaking as far as mothers go, and then multiple pregnancies increase that risk, previous hypertension, these are all things that would increase the risk of preeclampsia. Um, my sister has had eclampsia or preeclampsia or HELP syndrome with nearly every one of her pregnancies, and she didn't fit any of these requirements. So, um, well, now she's had the whole multiple pregnancy thing, but. All right, 20th week. This is where they start developing swelling in their feet. That's the edema they're talking about. A gradual increase of blood pressure. So gradually onset hypertension. This hypertension is not just a sudden one blood pressure was really high. We're talking about a pattern of her blood pressure increasing. Also protein in the urine. Now, women who are pregnant might have a high blood pressure they will probably have swelling in their feet and it's really good chance that you will see some proteins in the urine at, at a various point. It is the presence of all three of those simultaneously that is the concern here is what we're looking for. One of these on their own might be something, well, we probably need to keep an eye on that. And midwives will say, oh, we're going to check you again in a couple of days. I want you to come back just to have your urine checked. But most of the time, you've got to have all three of these symptoms together before you start thinking preeclampsia. Associated with this is your renal, uh, kidney and liver failure. These are where the eclampsia or the preeclampsia gets severe. The hypertension is really high. The toxicosis is really high. You can pop blood vessels in your brain causing a hemorrhage. The abrupto placenta is where the high blood pressure actually causes the uh, placenta and uterus from to separate. And then HELP syndrome is, and we'll talk a little about it more here, and I thought it was, um, all right, so it's hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Their body is in a autoimmune sense, destroying its red blood cells. The liver enzymes are elevated, indicating liver failure, and you're no longer to able to produce platelets because of the liver trauma. The um, liver plays a big role in the production of pl platelets. So hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and l low platelet levels. That's HELP syndrome. And that is a highly deadly uh, condition um, that is noted like 20 week on point of pregnancy. Now, once a woman has had a seizure, once we, uh, once seizure activity takes place during the pregnancy, we assume that the preeclampsia has turned to eclampsia, we treat it as such. And the treatment is aggressive mag sulfate. We could be looking at four to five grams, two to four grams is what some protocols say. And instead of pushing it in or in a bag and dripping it in, you're probably just gonna push it in a syringe because you need to get that magnesium in there quick. The complication of pushing magnesium too fast is you paralyze the diaphragm and that you'll stop breathing. This could happen to any patient anywhere. Pushing mag too fast, mag being a muscle relaxer, could cause the diaphragm to not have the strength to breathe. Well, the patient's seizing. They aren't having organized breathing. You're gonna to need to beg, bag them. So your best plan is get the mag in them, get, get the seizure to stop, you know, the eclamptic seizure to stop, and then bag them until their body starts to balance back out. That's really your best plan with that. Now, a woman with a history of epilepsy can get pregnant. So is this woman having an eclamptic seizure or is she having an epileptic seizure? Or is it a reaction to something else? Well, typically, historically, we would always assume that it was the eclamptic seizure and start with the mag. But we're seeing more and more people with history of epilepsy and having babies and such like that. So there's a really good chance that's all it is. And we, at least in my department, and I've seen several recommendations in other journals and such, suggesting that we treat this pregnant woman's seizure with Versed first 
see if it stops the seizure, and then with the mag sulfate, because Versed works really quick. Mag sulfate takes a little bit longer. So let's try to knock it out with a Versed. If it doesn't work, we haven't really wasted that much time, and then we'll hit them with the mag. These are problems that a woman might have associated with the seizure and associated with eclampsia. They didn't add the biggest one here, and that's death, because uh, if eclampsia isn't controlled, it can very rapidly turn into death. All right, diabetes. Gestational diabetes is that inability to process the carbs and use, and it's a lack of sensitivity to insulin that exists simply because of the pregnancy. Uh, almost always resolves uh, after the delivery, and it is typically easily managed with diet, just avoiding carbs as much as you can, uh, which carbs are necessary for the development of the baby, but they're just going to be more cautious with their carbs, and, and especially their simple carbs, in order to keep those blood sugar levels down. If not managed, if gestational diabetes is not managed, it could result in permanent diabetes uh, afterward, type 2 diabetes. So um, occasionally gestational diabetes needs oral medication like type 2 diabetes medications, but that's not very common. Uh, remember, the mother's um, blood is not being passed to the baby, but is exchanging its glucose levels and insulin levels and such with the baby. So just because mom's a diabetic and her blood sugar is really high, that means the baby's blood sugar is going to be high, but the baby doesn't have any problem with using insulin. So the baby's producing insulin and growing excessively large because of the excessively high levels of glucose and availability of insulin. So this can create... Um, fetal macrosoma, which is just big babies. So one of the reasons it's very important to monitor your blood sugar while you're pregnant. All right, so tell me what do you remember from this morning's lecture on respiratory on the respiratory system in the pregnant woman? The, uh, the fetus will push up on the diaphragm causing uh decrease decrease the minute volume or... no her minute volume is going to go up because she's going to be breathing faster she's going to need more air because of the fetus so if if the diaphragm is being pushed up what volume is being reduced The so the tidal volume could be, especially in later uh, pregnancy, but we typically just don't use all our lung capacity. So the tidal volume doesn't change a whole lot. It can. But the real changes are going to happen with your reserve volumes. She's not going to have any backup. So if she increases physical activity, tries to climb a flight of stairs, carry the groceries in the house, have sex, something like that, she's going to get really short of breath really quick because she's... Uh, doesn't have the reserve capacity that she normally does. And you laugh about having sex. It's an excellent way to induce labor. Because prostaglandins are what uh, trigger contractions and semen is full of prostaglandins in order to preserve the sperm. And prostaglandins are released during orgasm, so... All right, um, so with that respiratory disorder, with the changes in the respiratory function, your patient is going to be predisposed to her respiratory complications. If she has asthma, or COPD, CF, or some other underlying respiratory condition, it's going to be compounded by the pregnancy. She's going to be breathing more, moving more air, more, more likely to have an asthma attack kind of like exercise-induced asthma. What can that lead to, as you can see here, the various um, complications for the baby? 
most of these are being related to an inadequate volume of ox or quantity of oxygen or excess quantities of CO2, kind of like the respiratory acidosis. All right, any woman who's been pregnant and any man who's been married to a pregnant woman knows that women who are pregnant have nausea and vomiting especially in the first trimester. Morning sickness should not be called morning sickness. It should be called anytime I freaking feel like it sickness. Not that she feels like being sick, but her body just randomly says, you know what, I feel like being sick and screw you for being pregnant. And so she starts throwing up. Well, that's normal, that's expected and can be, there's various ways of managing it, but hyperemesis gravidium, her gravidarum, excuse me. This is a much more significant case of morning sickness. This is where the woman is not capable of keeping anything down. We're talking about violent, frequent projectile vomiting, heavy vomit, uh, can't drink anything, can't eat anything, and it's leading to a chronic state of dehydration and malnutrition. She is likely going to end up in the hospital with IV fluids, IV nutrition, and IV antiemetics. It can be very hard to control. Um, Zofran, not going to make a difference. In fact, most pre-hospital, or not pre-hospital, but most OTC or prescription uh, fenugrin, even suppositories, may not really do enough. But IV fenugrin mixed with hydralazine and some other, and maybe even diphenhydramine, some of these Mix, mixtures and combinations have shown to be a little bit more helpful, but a lot of your standard treatments for morning sickness will not be effective for these hyperemesis patients, these HG patients. You can see dehydration is a big concern here. You may need to give D10, D50, something like that. Probably going to have to give fluids, diphenhydramine if your protocol will let you. I'm not really a fan of the Zofran for these patients. It's just not going to work. If that's all you have, then use it. Um, four milligrams is not going to be enough. You're probably going to need to do eight. Um, so maybe call for med control if you need to. If her vomiting is that severe that you can't wait to the hospital. Personally, for these patients, I prefer fenugrin. I do have that at my disposal. If you don't have it, then you know I'm sorry. These patients do need to go to the hospital um, and be evaluated because of the potential for dehydration and malnutrition. So, all right, um, we already talked to you earlier about the renal disorders and the changes to the renal system and the risk for a person who's always already has renal failure of some sort, so not really going to get into this any further. RH factors, RH sensitization, a mother and a father who have two different RH bloods, all right? So it could be A positive and A negative. The A positive has a RH factor. The A negative, she does not have RH factor. So if the mother's RH negative and the father's RH positive, the baby is likely going to be RH positive. It could be ne negative, but it's likely to be positive. In the event that the mother's blood and the fetus blood mix in some way, meet each other, meaning like the uterus tears away, excuse me, the placenta tears away from the wall of the uterus, or there's some kind of minor trauma or something like that, then the bloods mix. Well, the mother's blood in the, will react to the Rh factor in the fetus blood, and that will produce Rh antibodies. And so the mother on a subsequent pregnancy might have a immune reaction to that fetus and to that placenta where the antibodies attack it and then she won't be able to maintain pregnancies. This is easily treated with a medication called Rogam. It is recommended for an RH positive or negative woman to take a shot of Rogam early in the pregnancy or, and or alternatively immediately after delivery. This gives um, Rogam, the medication, is designed to remove the antibodies, the Rh antibodies, from the mother's blood and basically cause her um, immune cells to forget Rh antibodies. And that way she doesn't have a Rh sensitization reaction, immune reaction against subsequent pregnancies. Infections are infections. They really don't train, change significantly with um, 
mother's strep uh what they're talking about here can be passed to the baby uh, specifically from a uti also stds any bacterial stds can be passed to the baby uh during the delivery process not during pregnancy but during the delivery process uh you might have heard of women getting a strep b test um prior to delivery that's what they're looking for here because the baby could um, have eye infections that could cause blindness it could cause respiratory problems pneumonia sepsis meningitis all these conditions so all right cholestasis infection inflammation um, excuse me cholestasis is simply the blockage of the common bile duct upper right quadrant pain stuff like this kind of feels like a gallbladder attack we talked about that in the uh, medical chapter um the pre the pregnancy and the size of the uterus and the um uterus pushing up into the diaphragm that's what's going to increase the likelihood of cholestasis all right so torch syndrome these are a number of different infections that if mom gets one of these it can go straight through to the baby and you'll notice a lot of these are viral so herpes cytomegala rubella um, there are some others out there these are infections that can be passed directly to the baby resulting in permanent uh, problems again this would easily be recognized during prenatal care and so a woman with prenatal care would know if this is a concern you could be prepared for it all right let's take a quick break i need to go get something to drink um let's just stretch our legs really quick and then we'll get back at this all right, so for those of you wondering how in the world I'm going to get through 80 more or 100 more slides in an hour, we're not. The sections about actually delivering babies and how the delivery process happens and all that, we're not actually doing that today. What I'm going to cover today is your um, conditions, to how to treat conditions uh, during pregnancy, during delivery, and immediately after delivery. Uh, the process of how to perform a delivery and all of that, we're going to do hands-on because it doesn't do any good for me to explain the positions and the methods and all that when you can't uh, use the simulators and things like that. So we're going to, when we have our hands-on day, we'll have the L&D simulator and um, obstetric simulator and we'll work on, work on that. I covered this earlier um, in gynecology and earlier in the chapter, so I'm not really going to get into this any further at this point in time. All right, so um, other terms, less, yeah, less relevant to what we're doing. Threatened abortion. Now, this is one to keep in mind. A woman who is pregnant, especially in the first and second trimester of pregnancy, may have what's called a threatened abortion. This is where she starts to have bleeding it can be caused because the placenta is tearing loose from the uterus or something like that but it doesn't develop all the way into a miscarriage so with rest with um sometimes it requires hormonal support and stuff like that something like progesterone or something along, um something along those lines with that kind of treatment the pregnancy can be preserved and everything turns out okay my wife actually had one of the uh, threatened abortion with our third born um with our daughter so it is possible for this so just because you respond to a call for early pregnancy vaginal ble bleeding it doesn't mean it has to develop or result in a miscarriage well, I'm not telling you to give your patient false hope. You could explain to them not all vaginal bleeding at this point is a miscarriage. However, if she's experiencing heavy vaginal bleeding, that's a miscarriage. There's no way around that. Severe abdominal pain, significant vaginal bleeding. Uh, we're not going to know anything about cervical dilation because we're not doing any internal exams. Those are cons those are indications of a actual uh abort um miscarriage minor or intermittent vaginal bleeding 
with or without pain, it may simply be a, a uh, threatened abortion. If she's miscarrying, there is a good, there is a possibility of her going into hypovolemic shock, especially if the bleeding is not controlled. Um, there's also the possible strong likelihood of a combination of psychogenic shock. So be prepared with fluids. Don't have her walk. Keep her laying down. Uh, syncope is very common in these cases. Incomplete is when she's having the miscarriage, not all the tissue from the uh, placenta has torn loose, and she, therefore her uterus is not contracting and she continues to bleed. This is where your real concerns for hemorrhage come from, and she's going to need a surgical procedure called a DNC to um, remove all of the leftover products of conception and uh, stop that bleeding. <clears throat> This is where the woman, where the fetus dies in the first uh, 20 weeks, but isn't actually passed. So she continues to carry a dead fetus. Um, while um, this could be just for a couple of weeks, it could be for an extended period of time. I did read of an unusual circumstance where a woman in her gosh, I want to say she was like 67 or something like that, was found to have been carrying a um, missed abortion for like 30-something years. That the And the fetus had fully calcified into a hard mass. Um, and she, of course, never got pregnant again. But um, she just, I think if I remember right, it was something to do with, maybe she was a little older than that. And she thought she'd gone through menopause. And just thought she had a really easy time of menopause and that was it but in fact she had gotten pregnant the fetus had died and she had never passed it this is another variation of that where instead of calcifying the um the feet well this could be from both a miscarriage or from an a elective abortion where infection sets in this could be due to the decomposition of the fetus or from the uh, presence of other bacteria or something like that other um, infectious um, organisms and it results in essentially a massive intrauterine infection and you're going to treat it like sepsis all right, so two major causes of third trimester bleeding. Most of the time, this is going to be placenta previa or pre abrupto placenta. Ectopic pregnancy is not third trimester. Ectopic pregnancy would be an early um, pregnancy bleeding because after like 12 weeks or whatever, I mean, even before that, the if the baby is in the fallopian tube, if the fetus is developed in the fallopian tubes, it's only going to be like, a few weeks or so before it's too large and it starts to cause a problem. So you're not going to have ectopic pregnancies in the third trimester. But we talked about those the, in the other video more, uh, specifically for ectopic pregnancies. Always assume it's an ectopic pregnancy versus an abortion in the early, preg in the early um, pregnancy early gestation simply because the ectopic pregnancy is far more severe and concerning than a um, miscarriage. So here's abrupto placenta. This is where the placenta has removed itself from the wall of the uterus before the baby is born. This could be caused by seizures, high blood pressure, or a number of other things that are unexplainable. This in this typically results in almost immediate fetal death. Um, even if this were to happen in the hospital or in the OR, it is most often unlikely that they could get the baby removed during a cesarean uh, fast enough to prevent death. Now, if it's a small abruption, probably a good chance of survival. But if it's anything significant, it is almost guaranteed to be death because most of the time you don't see the blood right away. The blood has to move from the top of the uterus down and out and at first it's not a whole lot and so by the time the woman sees the vaginal bleeding the fetus is already dead due to hypoxia because that is where the baby you know the that connection between the uterus and the placenta is where the baby gets all the oxygenation
All right, the dark red blood indicates that the blood has been there longer. It's older blood. It's not fresh blood. <laughs> and they can easily go into shock. They can, this can be a significant amount of blood. Now, placenta previa, on the other hand, has almost no associated pain, and the bleeding happens as soon as there's a problem. It's rather minor bleeding, and it's bright red blood. What's going on here is the placenta has formed or grown over the cervix. So as the woman's getting closer to delivery and the cervix starts to soften and starts its early dilation, it tears away from the placenta a little bit, causing a minor amount of bleeding, but it's only right as the cervix is starting to change its size and shape. That's why there's very little bleeding, and this does not typically cause fetal death because it's not that large of a separation. However, this will not this woman will not be able to deliver vaginally. This is going to be a cesarean birth. That's why regular um, prenatal care and ultrasounds will identify this problem. If this was to be unidentified and you found this in the field, you would not be able to deliver, uh, pre the delivery would be almost impossible until, or it would result in guaranteed death of the baby and highly likely the death of the mother because as the uterus and placenta separate, as the mother is forcing the baby through the placenta, it would result in so much blood loss on the part of both that it is very likely she would bleed out. but with the ability to identify the location of the placenta using ultrasound and the use of cesareans, this is a very uncommon concern, or very uncommonly an issue. Like, yeah, they have it, but it's no big deal. It's easily managed. All right. Um, of course, Always look for the possibility of intra-abdominal bleeding from some other or cause. Treat it like you would anybody else who's having trauma. Remember to keep mom on the left side. Um, fluids and transport. When mom is in shock, the baby's in shock, and you want to be very aggressive. If mom bleeds out and dies and you are controlling the bleeding and giving fluids and doing CPR, you continue to do so because you may be able to preserve some oxygenation to the fetus and there's still a chance that a um, emergency department cesarean would be able to save the fetus. All right, so stages of labor, I'm going to brush through this really quick. Not going to spend a whole lot of time on the labor section because that's really better done hands-on. So stages of labor, onset of labor pains, actual labor pains such as a um, regular contractions that increase in both organization and intensity. So uh, this will continue until the cervix is fully dilated at 10 centimeters. Uh, the amniotic flu sac may or may not rupture. Typically it does, but it doesn't have to. Second stage is from the time of fully dilated cervix till the delivery of the baby. All right. So the, pa the baby will change in position again. I'm going to get into that in the hands-on portion. <clears throat> Third stage, this is after the fetus has been delivered and now you're waiting for the delivery of the placenta. Um, you do not, if you're delivering in a pre-hospital environment, you do not need to wait on scene until this placenta is delivered, but you will not be able to control postpartum hemorrhage until the placenta is delivered. All right, so what's mom's body going to do when she goes into labor? Well, it's going to work harder. So all of this stuff's going to happen. White blood cell production is going to go up because she's going to be prepared for the possibility of infection and such like that. That fetal acidosis is also something that will prompt the first breath. Not going to talk about these so much. You can see them. They're here. We will get into this during the hands-on portion. Uh, same with the, um, frankly, with all of this. We're just going to move through.
there's your uh, placenta. Uh, it is important that you acquire the placenta, and if if it was delivered prior to your arrival or while you were on scene, that you transport it to the hospital so a uh, OB nurse can evaluate it. The big concern is looking for large um, port missing portions that would indicate that it's still attached to the inside of the uterus, which would cause bleeding. So that's what they're looking for there. All right, postpartum care. Now she's delivered, right? Baby's been, the umbilical cord's cut, baby's separated, or, you know, baby's out. What do you need to do? Well, these things are still possible. Even a woman who is having preeclampsia, just because she, well, delivery of the fetus or delivery of the baby is the treatment of preeclampsia and eclampsia, it is still possible for preeclampsia to progress to eclampsia after delivery. So she could still have an eclamptic seizure after delivery. Hemorrhage and shock become a big concern. Of course, respiratory difficulty, um, shortness of breath is going to be expected because she just had that physical activity, but it is uh, supposed to resolve. So other conditions like asthma, pulmonary embolisms, and things like that could all be a concern. Keep mom warm. The lochia they're talking about here, that is a vaginal discharge. It would be a combination of fluids, uh, mucus, and blood. Um, if it's evident blood clots, large quantities of it that's continuing, that's when you're going to start worrying about postpartum hemorrhage, and we'll see the volumes here in a minute. So what pharmacology might we need for mom? Um, you can do oral medications, probably going to take too long, especially in emergency sense. Mag sulfate, already talked about that. Um, might cause hypotension, might cause respiratory depression. Uh, very unlikely that you're going to deliver, or excuse me, that you're going to administer this. Very, very unlikely that she's going to have a problem with hypocalcemia. All right, so this can stop preterm labor. We've used this historically for the treatment of asthma, but it can be used to stop preterm labor. Where you might see this is with a uh, patient who you're doing inter-facility transport with preterm labor, maybe on like a magnesium drip, and then have routine doses of um, terbutaline, which is an analog of epi. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Valium Versed, these are fine for the treatment of seizures. Diphenhydramine, yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, you can use that for the hyperemesis gravidium or any other allergic reaction. Some departments will carry oxytocin, also known as Pitocin is the brand name. This is the hormone that's secreted by the body to con cause the contractions. The hospitals and midwives can use this to induce labor and increase the intensity of contractions. Women I know that have had it said they, they were, uh, they said intensity is uh, underestimation, you know, is saying it um, lightly um, or putting it mildly, I should say. So Pitocin can cause some heavy, heavy contractions, and as such can be really useful for postpartum hemorrhage, which is why we use it in the pre-hospital environment. If the woman is bleeding out heavily, a shot of Pitocin, which I believe, remember, is a milligram of Pitocin, but I'm not positive because I don't currently have that in my drug box. Um, anyway, uh, blanking. Anyway. Pitocin is uh, very good at contr uh, contracting the uterus and stopping the hemorrhage. Which, while these are a problem, especially the latter two, they are less common, um, especially in the pre-hospital setting. All right, PROM, 48 hours. This is rupture of the membranes before the uh, delivery. 48 hours is typically considered to be too long and it definitely puts the woman at risk. Although, if she hasn't had sex and she hasn't had a lot of vaginal exams by a provider during, since the rupture, there's a really, really isn't a significant concern there. The problem is an infection can move up into the uterus in that 48 hours if people keep putting their fingers up there doing vaginal exams and such, 
and that can cause, and if the membrane has ruptured and the amniotic fluid has been lost, that can cause the uh, infant to have the infection or to acquire the infection. So that's where your big concern is. So preterm labor, anytime they're in labor before 37 weeks, between 20 and 37 weeks. Remember, before 20 weeks, it's considered a miscarriage. In the pre-hospital environment, we don't know fetal distress. This is a deceleration of the heart, meaning the heart rate slows down, indicating fetal distress, uh, hypoxia and such like that. We're not going to know that because we don't typically carry a Doppler of any type to monitor heart tones and fetal heart rate. Uterine rupture could happen at any stage during the, uh, well, second and third trimester or during labor. This is going to be indicated by a woman in labor, actively contracting, significant pain, all that kind of stuff, and then suddenly an almost loss of contractions, the abdomen is soft, and she starts getting dizzy and showing signs of shock. Uh, the rest of her body starts reacting as such. This is extremely dangerous for mother and child and should be transported very rapidly. This is really the case. Like, this is why we're going to be there, right? Precipitous birth. It's happening really fast. That's why they called us and delivering in the field because most of the time they have enough time to get to the hospital. Pregnancies, they're, you know, birthing after 42 weeks. Okay, so the baby's been cooking longer than it should, and what the happens is the baby has an increased risk of uh, being, well, not risk, but likelihood of being larger, but also an increased risk of meconium staining because and meconium aspiration. There's a better chance that the uh, fetus would have already developed that far. So, Odorless, greenish black, very tar in, tarry in consistency. This could be in the amniotic fluid. It might have dissolved, causing the amniotic fluid to be very dark in color, or it may still be loose and in clumps, you know, in, uh, as a solid in the amniotic fluid. The concern here is if they inhaled it, is it blocking the vocal cords? And you're going to need to use your um, yonker suction and the laryngoscope to fish down in there. I've even seen some where they go in with the laryngoscope and use an ET tube connect to us, connected to the suction line um, to evacuate the um, meconium. But it is going to require manual or, you know, the mechanical suction. You can't just use the... Um, bulb syringe. The bulb syringe is for suctioning the nares, not and maybe the back of the mouth, but not down into the trachea. All right, mentioned this before, big babies, bigger than nine pounds and bigger. These are from your um, gestational diabetes patients. What do you do if you're having multiple gestation, right? Twins, triplets. Well, there's a really good chance one or more will be, need to be resuscitated, but they're often uh, rather small, um, or at least smaller than the average newborn. So the deliveries tend to be pretty um, simple, much easier be, uh, for mom because it is a smaller baby. And typically you won't have placenta delivery until both or all three or whatever, you know, all of the babies have been born. Um, use the Sharpie on their forehead, you know, baby A, baby B when they come out. Um, don't mix them up. Um, it's kind of important which one, which one was born first. It's helpful when one was a boy and one was a girl and you can say, hey, the boy came out first, the girl came out first, whatever. All right, intrauterine fetal, fetal death versus a stillborn. Intrauterine fetal death is when the baby has died and started decomposing prior to labor. The woman goes into labor and she delivers a decomposing baby. It's very evident that this baby has been dead. The skin is gray, it's sloughing, there's a foul odor. Um, it's a very unpleasant situation. Occasionally, hypoxia, cord around the neck, blood loss, um, 
abrupto placenta, something like that, could cause the, the fetus to die prior to delivery or during the delivery, but it hasn't been dead long enough to cause decomposition or whatever. When your um, when the fetus is delivered with obvious death, do not attempt resuscitation. But if the fetus appears fully deformed or fully formed and with no evidence of decomposition or anything like that, it is possible that it was simply died during the delivery process and resuscitation should be attempted. And we'll get into the specifics on resuscitation in the neonatal chapter next week. All right, I actually have a, a friend of mine that died from this amniotic fluid embolism. She died in her late, uh, like she was 28 years old and delivered a baby in the hospital and started having trouble breathing. They moved her um, to the ICU. As soon as she got to the ICU, she coded. They uh, worked the code, got her back, sent her to the OR. Uh, went in to try to uh, find the amniotic fluid embolism, and then she coded again in the OR, and they were not able to resuscitate her. This is a relatively uh, unusual but possible condition where during the delivery process, amniotic fluid is sucked into the mom's vasculature, and that thicker fluid is very different than blood lodges somewhere in the um, lungs causing a pulmonary embolism. What are we going to do? Treat them like we would every other pulmonary embolism. Hydrominose, this is a lot of amniotic fluid. Don't worry about it. Cephalopelvic disproportion. This is where a mommy with, a little, with little hips is having a baby with a big head. Most of the time, this is clearly recognized in the pre, uh, prenatal care, uh, ultrasounds and such, and C-sections are scheduled. This is rarely a concern as or like an unexpected surprise kind of a situation. All right, cephalic pre various presentations here. These are the way the baby might come out, not breech, but with their head in a different position. We will go over these presentations during the hands-on portion. So I'm going to move through here. Same with the breach. We will deal with breach during the hands-on portion. We actually do talk about how to deliver a breach because, um, well, if the baby's coming and they're breech, and there's a reason we're not at the hospital, so you're just going to have to deal with it. Now, shoulder dystocia. This is where the baby's coming out, and you. The shoulders are stuck in the pelvis. The head has been delivered, but the shoulder cannot. This typically results in the fetal shoulder, um, the clavicle breaking, and then being delivered with a broken clavicle, allowing the baby to move. This can cause nerve damage. Um, and kind of that's like the best outcome. That's the ideal outcome. Occasionally, they're stuck and you can't get them out. Again, this is a very rare circumstance. And then the fetus's head is in the vagina, partially protruding, but not fully protruding. And then you have to use your fingers to create a V around the baby's nose so that air can get to the nose and airway and the, um, allowing the baby to breathe. Also, you want to reduce the uh, contractions for mom. The body is going to contract, but what you can do is have her not bear down, have her not hold her breath. When the contraction's happening, have her pant. If she sits there and <laughs> panting during the contraction, it will prevent her from having a full push effect, and um, it'll stop the pressure on the baby with every contraction. McRoberts technique is a method that we can go over again in hands-on, but basically you put the mom back into the position she got pregnant in and you'll get that baby out, right? What's it take to spread those hips and, well, hyperflex her knees to her chest and have her pull the, her legs as high as she can. Basically, can she put her ankles behind her head? That's what you're trying to go for. All right, so nuchal cord. 
another circumstance really better handled hands-on this is where the cord is wrapped around the infant's neck during delivery and you will have to either move it you know slip it from around their neck or you're gonna have to um, clamp it and cut it during the delivery process we'll go over that that part hands-on now prolapse cords so this is where the baby has not fully engaged into the birth canal while the mother is um, dilating and gone into labor and noted typically during a vaginal exam by like a provider, midwife, uh, OB or something like that, where the cord protrudes into the vagina in um, ahead of the uh, infant's head, the fetus's head. So every time the uterus contracts, the head is being pushed against the wall of the cervix, squishing the cord between the cervix and the infant head. This causes a, a interruption of blood flow between the infant and the placenta. That means the baby is hypoxic. So this can be um, deadly. So the treatment for this is, is I mentioned a minute ago, you stick your fingers in there to make a V when the baby's head is partially um, delivered, like with shoulder dystocia. This is the other time that you will put your fingers inside the delivery mother's uh, vagina. You will again create a V or basically put your fingers on either side of the umbilical cord so that every time the mother has a contraction and the baby's head is being pushed against the wall of the cervix, your fingers are what's absorbing that compression instead of the umbilical cord being compressed. Once you've committed to this position, you are going to have to remain in that position until the baby is delivered via cesarean. You do not reinsert the cord or anything like that. You're not gonna be able to push it back in there and out of the way. This is a, the cord is sticking out, so you stick your fingers on either side of it. And so every time she has a contraction, it's your fingers between the baby's head and the wall of the cervix um, that's getting squeezed and not the cord. This will uh, allow blood flow to the fetus to continue and in, with all hope prevent the, um, the death of the fetus but um think about this in the position you put your hand when you go in there i would strongly recommend that you insert your hand palm up simply because you're going to be there for a little while and palm down you're going to have to like lay at the foot of the stretcher with your arm like that it's going to be very awkward for you so i would recommend palm up so that you can more or less sit on the bench or something like that while you're dealing with this um, this is not going to be comfortable or pleasant for either you or the mother so i'm not trying to you know say that it will be this will be a rather awkward and difficult situation but this is the one time we will uh, put our fingers in there and it is for the intention or expectation of saving the fetus's life. And again, you can have her uh, pant with the contractions. That way, um, she's not, during the contraction, she's not compressing as hard. She's not getting as much pressure. All right, so we talked about uterine inversion in the chapter 22, mentioned it that it can exist, happen immediately after delivery. Remember, if it can happen, uh, when it happens after a delivery, it can, you can attempt a, um, a replacement of the uterus. If the placenta is still attached, do not attempt to pull or separate the placenta from the uterus. Do not do that. But if the uterus has uh, prolapsed during the um, or during the delivery or right after the delivery of the placenta, you can make one attempt to uh, pr push it back up inside the vagina and hopefully back up through the cervix. That way, it would. Um, not dry out. Otherwise, you're going to cover it with moist dressings and transport the patient on her side. All right, postpartum hemorrhage. 
We hear a lot about it, but what is it actually? Blood loss greater than 500 milliliters within 24 hours, right? Blood loss is expected, right? You probably heard about the postpartum panties and such like that where they basically take giant ABD pads and tape them to their butt. They are gonna bleed, there'll be a lot of discharge, it's very uncomfortable, they got ice packs all up in there and everything trying to help. But if the blood loss is greater than 500 milliliters in 24 hours, then you're dealing with a hemorrhage. Typically, we're gonna see the hemorrhage and recognize it pretty early on. Like we're talking like, she's still bleeding, it's continuous large quantities, we're at 500 milliliters, we need to be acting on this. And that is an immediate surgical emergency, transport a, um, in an emergency status, uh, and fluids, um, yeah, so IV fluids, all that. The, if the uterus has, excuse me, if the placenta has already been delivered, then you're going to want to massage the fundus. That's the top of the uterus. And you will, with palpation, you'll notice that it is spongy. That's because it's not contracting. That's what's causing the bleeding. So what you want to do is massage it very aggressively. We're talking about that deep tissue Swedish massage, whatever you want to call it. Like you, if she's not trying to punch you because it hurts so bad, you are not doing it aggressively enough. I understand that sounds violent, but postpartum hemorrhage is, is a killer and it takes a lot of force to massage that uterus into a contraction. What you're trying to do is stimulate the uterus to produce enough oxytocin to contract so that uh, the contraction will constrict the blood vessels and stop the bleeding. Another option is to um, stimulate or, or well stimulate the nipples ideally through breastfeeding. Once the baby latches and starts sucking, that causes an oxytocin uh, release, and that will help contract the uterus. Um, this is why women will often find breastfeeding immediately after delivery to be very, uh, you know, even for a few days. Uh, they will find it to be extremely uncomfortable um, because they'll start having massive contractions. It's very, um, it can be very painful. So massage the uterus, uh, encourage the breastfeeding, IVs, fluids, um, and we've already pointed out multiple times, you aren't going to place any dressings in the vagina. Pulmonary embolism. We already kind of talked about amniotic fluid, so any other form of embolism is possible. It's a PE. It looks like a PE, like anybody else. You treat it like a PE. It is what it is. All right. We doing okay? So postpartum depression can happen up to one year after birth. It can happen right, it can uh, kick in right before or immediately, um, you know, immediately after birth and or as much as a year later. It, she may never have had postpartum depression before. It may, she may have a history of depression, but it's, unique because it's going to it can be directed more towards the infant like anger or resentment or no interest whatsoever like an apathetical attitude towards the infant or even thoughts of harming themselves or the infant and this has resulted in a lot of really sensational uh headlines in the news but in the past but it's a real tragic condition it's easily treated and it's something that should that we should be on the lookout for uh, in the pre-hospital environment you know because i've seen it where the reason we were there wasn't so much that there was a problem with the baby as much as the mom's perception of what was wrong with the baby what was exaggerated like she she thought there was a problem there really wasn't and it was because of her depression or because of her and so it was like a response like she's been dealing with the depression and all of a sudden she's reacting extremely protectively which caused her to call 911 and such like that so just be aware of that when dealing with a woman who has recently had a baby um 
and be on the lookout for it because unless it gets reported uh, you know, to her healthcare providers or whatever, they're not gonna be able to get treatment for it. And it is rather easy to treat. All right, trauma during pregnancy. Lots of different causes. Women who are pregnant are at an increased risk of domestic violence and domestic abuse. Um, so we've talked about the ph physiologic changes in their body. This, um, you know, the increase of blood volume, the increase of heart rate and cardiac output, and respiratory rate, all of which make it harder for her to compensate for trauma, to uh, flu blood loss from trauma. But also because that uh, diaphragm is higher in the chest, abdominal organs are higher in the chest. So chest trauma has a greater likelihood of causing upper abdominal organ injury, whether that's pancreatic, uh, splenic, or hepatic, or um, stomach injuries. Trauma to the baby. The uterus uh, in the first trimester is below the level of the pelvis. So it's, I mean, unless her pelvis was run over by a dump truck, she, there's really no concern there. Right? Even the seat belt is above where the uterus is going to be. Second and third trimester, now the uterus has actually gotten pretty thick. There's the amniotic fluid. She's probably put on a little bit of weight in the abdomen, so there's a lot of protection. It is highly unlikely in a car accident that there, the trauma would be transferred to the fetus. Uh, simply because there's that, there's just a lot of protection. If she was wearing her seatbelt properly under her um, abdomen, you know, above, at, right across her hips and below the pregnant abdomen, there's very little chance of harm to the uh, fetus. They get very worried and they need a lot of reassurance, but there's very little chance of harm. Penetrating trauma and direct blunt force trauma into the abdomen is a completely different story. Those can uh, be trans that that energy can be transferred directly to the infant. All right. Um, <clears throat> when the mom is bleeding from internal injuries, external injuries, hemorrhage, whatever, when she's bleeding, she's going to shunt the blood away from the fetus, causing hypoxia to the fetus. And so that's why we want to be quick. Uh, we want to treat shock early and aggressively. So don't wait until she's showing uh, obvious signs of shock. If you suspect shock, start treating for it. Or if the mechanism of injury indicates that shock could be possible start treating for it. Not going to spend a lot of time on this because most of us have no way of measuring this. So there's your transport, left lateral recumbent. It is more comfortable to place something between her knees like that. A woman uh, towards the end of pregnancy's hips will start to spread with the relaxin that we talked about, the hormones and the uh, relaxing of the ligaments. So um, it'll be comf more comfortable for her if you can place something between her knees. I already mentioned this earlier. If the woman goes into cardiac arrest for any reason, perform CPR and ALS care as you would for any other patient. Even if you think that the, the trauma that caused the cardiac arrest is unsurvivable, like decapitation or something like that, if you can stop the bleed, control the bleeding, continue to treat the, um, well, of course, decapitation would be a little extreme, but you, you get the point. If you if you can continue CPR, do so because it is possible that the fetus is viable. And that is the OB chapter. Um, and y'all didn't think I could do that.